Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Um, I'm very pleased to open up this session on financing the net zero transition. I can't think of anyone uh, better that I'd rather have this conversation with than the panel we've, assess we've assembled today. Um, got some great diverse perspectives on this challenge of how we're going to increase rapidly uh, the flow of capital into solutions uh, for climate change. I'll just introduce our speakers and then we'll have an open conversation, uh, which, um, well, which hopefully we'll dive into this topic and um, find out their views. So we're joined by Sunny Harvard, uh, who is the president of asset management business for UBS and, and, and looks after their uh, sustainable investment business. We have uh, Commissioner uh, Mered McGuinness, uh, the Irish commissioner in charge of the financial services uh, commission um, within the European Commission. We also uh, joined by um, Philip Hildebrand uh, of BlackRock, who is the vice chairman and responsible for sustainable investment at BlackRock. Thank you and welcome. And finally, and not, uh, last but not least, Bill Winters, Chief Executive of the Standard Chartered Bank and uh, a member of the, um, the task force on the voluntary carbon market. Thank you all for joining me. I know it's all different time zones and uh, hopefully we'll have a strong coffee. Um, and I wanted to just kick off this session by asking your views on what are some of the what are some of the barriers and enablers in your experience of how we get these large sums of, of capital reallocated into uh, solutions for climate change? These are going to be physical infrastructure assets that are often going to be long lived. So how do we uh, de-risk investment and get that flow moving? And perhaps if I come to you, Sunny, first, would that be OK? Sure. Uh, and thanks for having us uh, at UBS. I think, um, you know, there are a lot of barriers, one less with the uh, change in the administration in the United States. I think what President Biden has done to rejoin the climate uh, the Paris Accord and all of the uh, things he's following on in his policies to allow more freedom of flow for investments into climate and other ESG products, I think will help us a lot, giving uh, the private markets an ability to be global in our approach as opposed to carving out the U.S. and our issues is one of the first. Look, I, I think we've got tremendous demand among our clientele around the global. I think we've got um, the private sector very, very engaged in designing products. Um, the missing link right now is data, consistency of data around the globe so that we can create more products to meet that demand. Um, that becomes even more uh, difficult when you think about um, many investors want to get into financing renewables and a lot of the pre-IPO products and the capital that we really need for that project finance as a private market. So how do you get the data even away from general meetings and away from proxy votes and all of that will be a another barrier that we have to face. But I have to say, I think we've come a long way in just the last two years at pulling down a lot of those barriers. And I feel pretty good about the prospects for the climate aware universe, if you will, of products and investment. That's wonderful. Um, coming to you next, Mered, if that's OK. Um, obviously, it, sometimes it's going to take a public um, the public move to de-risk some of these investments because many of them are becoming cost competitive and profitable, but there's still a lot of solutions which are still too high up the cost curve. So could you talk briefly about the role you see um, the Commission playing in helping with that, uh, that challenge? Well, I'm going to pick up on this point about information and data. I think that's absolutely clear because what's happening at the moment is awareness is very high. And we have, if you like, both the demand and, and the supply issues, I think, beginning to come into balance. The issue, as I hear it from companies and uh, investors is knowing what exactly is sustainable. We know what, what's not working and we know the brown industries, but in terms of other sectors, and your, your headline is about transition. We, for example, at EU level have our taxonomy on sustainable activities, which is very clear and science led, and we're debating that with stakeholders at the moment. And what that is, is both a destination and a signpost. Um, and our greatest concern is that we make sure that those industries that want to transition to net zero and need investments, that they get the finance to do that. And it's very reassuring to hear that the industry side, the financial side, is also wanting to do that. And I suppose I think that's been driven by a, long, a lot of talk about climate over a long period of time. I think that the COVID-19 crisis has also been quite a, a catalyst to shake up um, the globe and realise our vulnerabilities and how we need to tackle these things. I suppose there are other issues. 
at EU level that we, we are also aware of. There's a global need to be coordinated. So we tend to be ambitious, perhaps more so. And I think we want to be leaders in this field, but we also work globally with the international platform on sustainable finance. And to your point about public-private, I mean, this is key, um, but I do believe that the political will, and this is the most important thing, the political will is there to do more and to do it more rapidly. The leaders at EU level have agreed that the ambition for 2030 will be higher than we currently have. So the Parliament wants 60% reduction in emissions by 2030. Uh, the leaders have said 55%. And, and those are tough targets to meet. And it's a very short period of time. So mobilising capital for these investments would be absolutely critical, as will ongoing research and innovation. And we're also involved in that space. But in one sense, the big debates are over. Now we're looking at let's talk about how to get the money flowing, because we will not have um, carbon neutrality, net zero, unless the finance flows towards sustainability. And I'm really pleased to hear some leaders in this area who perhaps have not been speaking out in the past now coming to the table and wanting to be part of this very big movement. Yeah, um, there's so much I'd love to come back on, but I'm going to move on to Philip and ask uh, Philip, you the same question uh, from, from BlackRock's perspective. Um, how are you feeling? What are some of the remaining barriers and, and what's been enabling recent in recent months and years? Of course, and thank you for having uh, us here this morning. So I'd say, first of all, you know, it's important to frame just how big the problem is. We're going to need to mobilize somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six, seven trillion dollars per year for many, many years to come. So the challenge is enormous. And so the question of what blocks it, what enables it, I think is very important. Uh, the, the positive news, of course, is that, as the Commission has said, we now have over 120 countries that have explicit regulatory legislative net zero goals. The U.S. has joined. That's a, that's a very big step. The change is certainly fundamentally the whole landscape. We also have a period where fiscal spending is very much uh, live and going on, and countries Again, the Commission with its recovery fund at the at the forefront of this is spending a lot of money, a lot of public money, and is, is clearly saying a significant part of this, 30%, let's say, in the European case, has to go into spending uh, for climate transition. The key now is to use this regulatory convergence and the willingness to use public money as an enabler, as a catalyst to get private money flowing, because no matter how big the commitment will be from the public side, it will not be enough to get to the trillions of dollars per year for many years to come. So we desperately need the mobilization of private capital. And the way that can happen is by having, and this has been mentioned by the commissioner, you know, we need a global standard that allows capital to respond uh, to the public policy incentives and start to help mobilize these enormous sums of money that we will need to fund the transition to net zero. Thank you so much. Um, and Bill, um, from your position, uh, it, it, you know, Standard Charter, you know, how are you seeing this lens? And if you could say something a little bit perhaps about Asia, that would be really fantastic, because of course there's so much long-lived assets there that do need to transition. Um, I'd be fascinated to hear your views. Yeah, I, I, uh, thanks for having me. First of all, I, I'll pick up on, on a few of the comments that uh, Philip and and, Ray and and Sunny all made, which I think are are, are spot on. Uh, the, the the need uh, certainly across the sustainable uh, sustainable development goals is probably ten trillion dollars per year, of which climate is, as Philip said, is probably something like six trillion for years to come. Uh, the, uh, the the, the substantial problem that we have right now is, is the, the, where the framework is reasonably well established in Europe and, and you know, well done to the European Commission for making sure that, that happens. Uh, it's not well established on, on a global basis. And the, uh, the ability for that capital to move into many of the developing economies, which are both the source of, of a lot of the emissions that, that we're all struggling to contain, but also at the highest risk of the consequences of climate change. Uh, we're, we're far from having a framework that's suitable. So, uh, whereas uh, we can see a path to getting to something like 80% or more of the financing requirements in Europe, and I think the Americas, uh, the U.S. Now that we've uh, that we've got a, an administration in the U.S. that's supporting the cause, uh, the available financing in emerging markets is less than 10%. Uh, less than 10% of what's needed. Uh, and as Philip said, uh, without having a a coordinated private and public sector approach. 
to that huge financing gap in emerging markets, most notably in South Asia and uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but as you mentioned, also other parts of Asia uh, that uh, are, in addition to everything else, particularly badly impacted by the COVID pandemic. So uh, the, the private sector capital that was finding its way into emerging markets is much less likely to do so uh, when the risk profile has increased so much on the back of all the stresses and strains uh, around the COVID pandemic. So. Uh, I would uh, say that the, the most substantial uh, barriers to achieving the, the financing targets that we've all got, uh, one would be getting the, that, that reestablished coordination between the public and the private sector in order to, as Philip said, to catalyze uh, private sector capital, the public sector uh, will need to step up. Uh, that certainly uh, in many cases will be led through blended finance type transactions uh, led by the multilateral agencies. Uh, but uh, direct government assistance will be helpful at times as well. Uh, this problem can be solved. Uh, you know, they, they've looked at this from the other side, and I know we've got two experts on the panel uh, who can speak uh, directly from the asset management perspective, but there's a $50 trillion opportunity here, investment opportunity. Uh, the, these are interesting assets. Uh, these are assets that, that savers want to invest in, uh, both for social reasons, but also because they should generate an acceptable return on a risk-adjusted basis. Uh, but what we'll need to do to, to really tap into that $50 trillion opportunity is get the standards right and then get the public sector partnership right. Fantastic. Um, I wonder if um, you mentioned there, Bill, um, the word risk, and and it feels to me that the the way that the finance sector views risk has got to be fundamental to this transition, both in terms of um, what I worry about, which is physical risk of climate change, you know, the, the sort of cascading impacts that we're starting to see, even at just one degree warming, you know, the globe is not experiencing that as an average. There are parts of the world which are seeing really substantial changes far faster than we expected. And um, so physical risk feels like it's accelerating. Then you've got transition risk of, of, you know, again, the globe is not equal. There are some countries highly dependent on carbon and, and supply of carbon and the consumption of carbon. And um, their risk is, you know, what do we do? How do we cope with that huge shift um, that's about to happen? And um, so that does make it a really complicated challenge. I completely agree with you. I think the technologies are there, um, but we do need that political will. So, Mered, if I could come back to you and and when you think about Europe, I mean, Europe's quite nice. It's our kind of microcosm of the world in some ways. You've got very coal dependent countries. You've got very agricultural dependent countries like your own. How do you politically manage that risk of, of transition? Well, I think your um, introduction to this point speaks to the problem that uh, we're not all equal um, and things are not fair. Um, but I, I was interested in how um, some of my colleagues, if you like, prefaced this debate. The amount of investment needed is enormous. But remember, there was an amount of investment put into um, brown uh, technologies up to now, and it was enormous too. So it's about redirecting. And I'm, I'm glad that what Bill said, it's not impossible, but it does need coordination. So yes, even within Europe, there are worries from some member states, some sectors about what this will all mean to them. And I really answer that very plainly by saying, look, we've made a commitment both by 2030 and then 2050. So the direction of travel is in one way only. There is no way back. And in order for us to meet that target here at EU level, and we have a global commitment to do that, you start by looking at each sector, identifying what is sustainable and helping industries move towards it. So I think finance is absolutely crucial. I think the political context is crucial. And here's one thing I think is really missing from the piece. I think we need to understand how difficult this is for individuals on the ground. So if we close down uh, peak um, uh, factors factories in, in, in the region I come from, workers are, are really affected. Are we looking after their interests really well? Because unless we get buy-in from society, and I, I was listening again to Bill about Asia and the problems there, we need uh, citizens to buy into this. There is a willingness um, among citizens uh, to address climate change, but when it impacts on their particular life or job, we have to be there with the public supports in order to make sure that the transition is just. And I think if we don't to do that, that will be a bigger barrier to progress. Let me also say 
that, you know, companies, asset managers have a duty of care and a responsibility to deliver on this. So we don't have choice in this. And I would really love to hear this morning from those who are in asset management, you know, the three key things they need and maybe not just looking at it from their perspective. That's obviously the job, but also looking at it in the wider global context that if they fail. So in other words, if we fail to deliver on this, really, that's quite a shocking thought. And given that we are currently in a, a world where we're all stuck where we are, we don't mix with people because a pandemic we never prepared for has hit us. You know, I think this is a real wake up call for the world about what can happen. And it's not as if it's decades away. It's very close to us. So I'd love my ask here this morning. It's why I want to listen in, um, you know, with clarity, what do you need? But also don't think of it only from your perspective. Um, what are investors asking for? Today, it's not just about that uh, crude return Turn on investment. It's about a wider issue of delivering on sustainable future environment, um, you know, all of those things around that biodiversity and climate change. So it's complicated, it's messy. Mm. But if we don't do it, then we won't be talking in, in 30 years time, it will be over. I, I think uh, you've hit on something there, which is uh, the extent to which we might be expecting the finance sector to try and do this. I, I sometimes worry that, you know, the finance sector is there to do to do what it does, right, which is to make a return and to, you know, mm -hmm. to oil the wheels of business. And I, I worry that it's on politicians and public will um, to sort of create the right conditions rather than expect the finance sector to to solve it. And I, I worry sometimes we, we think too, you know, put too much emphasis on that. But Sunny, um, Maret asked a very direct question there. It, it, do you have a, a, you know, a wish list uh, that would help help in terms of um, driving these things forward? I, I, I do, and I, and I agree completely. I'll, I'll start by saying I think the definition of return has shifted um, for many years. And again, even in the United States, very recently, it was all about just a financial return and an absolute measure. I, I, I don't think that's the way it is. The, the world of investing has moved for years into outcome-based investing. So whether it was income or absolute return or relative value, whatever, um, adding a social return on top of that is not as big a shift as many people think. And I, we are seeing that that grassroots demand. So I, I think a lot of that is there already. I think in terms of what we need, I'll, I'll maybe shift it, um, Commissioner, back to you. We do need consistent and available data. And I think the regulators and legislatures have been great about getting that. We need more of it and we need it globally. Um, I think a consistent approach around the globe would be good. Again, big steps recently uh, in the U.S. to pull us online. But as much as I, I think we can get a lot of help on uh, what data we have available, I will caution the legislatures to stop short of telling us how to use the data. And I'm just going to pick up on something you said. Transition is absolutely critical here. So there are two types of investing that we can do now and generally in the parlance, which is exclusionary right? You cut off whole sectors or you cut off investments. And the number of people will tell us if we don't do that, it's not sustainable investing. And then there's the tra transition side. And, and we very much believe in engagement of companies and bringing them along and helping them with that transition. Every company will be at different phases. And, and how we do that is important. And I think we do have a critical role to play as asset <coughs> managers in, in achieving that. Um, so if we have definitions of what is sustainable that are too narrow or can't change over time as new data sets and new analytics come in, we might stifle innovation. Um, mm -hmm. So again, in cutting off fossil fuels from an investment is eco-friendly for sure. Transitioning companies and, and, and or maybe even a long short strategy where you're going long those that are transitioning uh, more readily versus short those that aren't caring at all about it. These are all different ways to approach that mobilization of capital that the commissioner talked about that we need to see. So it's just a cautionary tale, not too definitive in terms of what we're coming out with, but more data for sure and consistency of that data are on top of our list. Yeah, fantastic. Um, turning to Philip, um, from BlackRock's perspective, um, you know, do you see, do you have a wish list? Are there innovations that you're driving that uh, are going to help win this, win this, uh, in this uh, challenge? The, the good news is the asset management, the, the capital owners, as well as the asset managers are now at the front end of what's going to be a tectonic shift uh, towards sustainable investing. That's clear. 
And we firmly believe that's only the very beginning. The reason this has been triggered is because policy has converged around a global net zero framework, uh, as everybody has stated here. So the beginning is set. What we now need is clarity on how we're going to get there, and it needs to be just and equitable and fair. I think everybody has rightly pointed this out. It's going to take time. And then what we urgently need, rising carbon prices, that's a policy matter ultimately. And then finally, I think the key to have definitional standards that clearly quantify or, or define what is climate compatible, net zero compatible investment and what isn't. And, and I think, again, the commission deserves a lot of credit for having set out first on this journey through the taxonomy. Uh, what we now need is a concept that can be applied globally. And I think the joining of the U.S. into these discussions, of course, is the great opportunity. The more convergence we have around the global standards, the more clarity what that's going to be, the, the more rapidly we can then see this tectonic shift take place uh, in order to mobilize the trillions uh, that we need. So mm -hmm. this is a classic case of, you know, you begin with good public policy, you use public money as a catalyst, and then private money flows. I think it's very important when we talk, this is a kind of a private sector in many ways uh, agenda, but we have to always remember that at the outset, you need a coherent, good policy incentives through public spending, which we now have, and then private money can fall. Yeah, that, I have to say, I've, I've witnessed the transition of the electricity sector in the UK from a policymaker's perspective, and saw the power of successive policies, consistent policies that enable the de-risking, and that we kind of need that to spread globally. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to come to you, Bill, um, to get specific here on this on this global standards question. I mean, it, it is it is uh, going to be different, right, at a global level from from a European level because the, the scale of the challenge. Let's just take China for example. Um, you know, replacing all of that thermal coal infrastructure, it might mean that our definitions, as as Sunny said, need to be relatively flexible to allow those innovations to come through that can really replace those thermal assets. And, and so do you sort of have a sense that there will be, what's the right fora in which we can discuss this globally? Will it be a combination of the US, China and Europe kind of converging? Well, I think that there, there's clearly an opportunity for uh, for multilateral discussions around around standard settings and, and shared objectives. But you know, I, I, I go back to the, the title of this, of this conference and the word that we that we throw around a lot, uh, which is which is transition. You know, it, it, at the end of the day, governments have made their own net zero commitments. Uh, businesses, uh, for the most part, uh, have been making them in one way or other, uh, even earlier. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the people who are going to reduce emissions. Are, are businesses and 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 individuals uh, who are engaging with businesses? So that that's uh, so. So I think we, we have to start with with a good understanding of what is the net zero transition for each one of the people that are making these commitments, right at the ground, uh, individuals to the extent that, that we want to do that, uh, but but certainly businesses. Uh, and as Philip said right at the outset, and others, uh, we need to get some some common understandings around the metrics. How are we measuring the the, the progress that we're making? Uh, uh, governments can be helpful in that, but uh, as as much of the reduction is going to need to come uh, as a result of actions taken by businesses uh, around the world, uh, this needs to be a, a business led initiative as well, informing government policy and obviously following government policy as that as that policy comes out. And the, the, there will be a continuous a continuous and iterative process. And the, the very the very essence of communicating a net zero commitment and, and, and recognizing that many companies have made 1500 companies by, by my count have made net zero commitments relatively few have said exactly how they're going to do that and how they're measuring it along the way because the standards aren't clear yet uh, i think as we get convergence on, on what we think are acceptable standards and there are pure private sector initiatives spent a, a fair amount of time here at, at the wef uh, this week, talking about those, uh, we're getting real, real backing for that. Uh, taking that, uh, that that agreed set of standards, uh, and then having that go back into the interplay with whether it's the EU taxonomy or or uh, or uh, other global uh, and, or multilateral negotiations around what are the agreed standards is a critical piece to that. Now mm -hmm. we all know that, that most businesses uh, aren't going to be able to get to net zero entirely through their own reduction activities, right? That, that has to be the, the first and an and, and overall priority is for every business to reduce its own carbon yeah. emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. But ultimately, there's going to have to be some facility for people to get to net zero by transferring money to other people, 
uh, who are able to actually remove carbon from the environment, uh, which may not be the businesses that we run. And uh, I don't want to, to, to front run the, the task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets uh, too much, which we're talking about this evening. Uh, but, but having a, a robust market will also be very supportive in terms of, of uh, helping us all agree those common standards because there will be a market attached to it. Mm. I'm going to end with a quick fire round, if that's okay. Oh, Mered, what did you, did you I, want to come back on that? I thought really helpful from my side, but can I just say the issue of, you know, having um, science-based taxonomy, which identifies sustainability and loosening it up to much wider, I think is, is difficult, um, even though there are pressures uh, to do that, because I think you've got to follow the science. I do think that we need also to look at the transition, and that's less clear about sectors, how they will do that and how they will get access access to finance. But we don't have a choice. And even today, we didn't have a choice. We couldn't fly, we couldn't meet, because the world said stop, a, a pandemic, a virus stopped us. Climate change is the same. We don't have choice here. And while the role you're saying of the finance sector, it can't do it all or, or whatever point uh, that you said earlier, I think there's also a duty on the finance sector and asset managers to be part of what is the best future for the next generation. And I'm really happy what Sunni said, that we're not just looking at the cold, hard return on investment statistic. There is a wider debate here. It's difficult for some companies to take that on board, but there's no choice. Thank you so much. Right, I'm going to end with a quick, rapid question, if everyone can just give me their top succinct answer to this. It does feel uh, there's, as if there is this alignment now, but there's so much change that needs to happen. And there's probably, you know, decades of built in uh, biases within all our systems, whether they're governmental or, or the finance sector. So culturally and, and within our own frame of, of influence, what are some of the things that we can do to sort of shift that cultural backdrop to this challenge? Um, and if you've got a kind of idea about within your own business, you know, what you're seeking to do to try and spread this uh, awareness out of sustainable investment across across uh, you know much broader into the sector. Uh, quick answers would be wonderful, and then we'll we'll be wrapping up and going into a private session. So, uh, uh, who shall I start with? I'll go in reverse order. So, Bill, <laughs> uh, clear commitments, uh, clear metrics, and a high degree of transparency. Fantastic. Thank you, Philip. I would say the same. I can only tell you in addition that the, the motivation internally of our staff is extraordinary. So I count a lot on the kind of the personal commitment that we have. I've never seen our staff so excited as, as they are right now as we issue these new uh, guidelines on how we're going to do this. Excellent. And uh, Mered? You know, well, yeah, look, yeah. I've kind of answered that in a way, and I'm glad to hear that at asset management level there is this commitment and we need to see it delivered on. I think at the political and societal level, I said earlier, we may need to make sure that everybody is on this journey and that the transition is just. And I think that's not just a European wish. I think across the globe we know that there are injustices around climate change. So we need to get that right, because if we don't have support from the ground up, then we will have real problems. Thank you. And Sunny, uh, culturally, how do we shift culture? I think it's a combination maybe of all of them. I think every company has a purpose and expanding that purpose or refining that purpose to ensure that it includes socially acceptable, the social dynamic ESG type goals would be critical. That starts the grassroots that Philip mentioned in terms of the culture of your entity and then it, ex it expands to all of your clients, vendors, everybody else that's engaged. So a purpose driven company, including ESG in that purpose. Fantastic. And, you know, just a reflection that, you know, we've obviously, as, you, as you've touched on, uh, we have gone through this extraordinary um, couple of, you know, year, a year of, of complete disruption and that um, moment to kind of take stock and, and think about what, you know, wh how fragile are, is, the, is the sort of structure that, that we've created. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll see some lessons learned about that public-private engagement that, that has led to, you know, record uh, speeds of, of vaccine development, um, the capital system mobilizing, um, government creating purchase guarantees to sort of make markets. It's, it has been, a, it's been a real challenge. And I, I think just reflecting personally, there always the problem with climate is how do you make it feel as urgent as, as these uh, more direct threats to, to human health? Because I think, Mered, you summed it up that it, it is not a long distance threat. This is something that's unraveling now. Um, so how do we get that urgency uh, into this question? And maybe it is going to be a case of looking at what's worked so far uh, in, in sectors that are decarbonizing, but also learning from the COVID experience. Um, 
thank you so much for your uh, comments this morning. Uh, really appreciate everyone joining us at different hours of the day. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for coming. <laughs>